This video was sponsored by Coursera. In the 1990s, the Gates Foundation, along with several other nonprofits, began to advocate for breaking up larger schools into smaller ones. And the reason for this is that they noticed several of the smaller schools were outperforming pretty much all of the larger ones. Well, it turns out this actually is the case pretty much anywhere that you look. In fact, a lot of good things tend to happen to areas with smaller populations. Like, the safest towns tend to be those with smaller populations. Or the states that have the lowest percentage of people with brain cancer also have smaller populations. And we could just keep going. But there's also something I'm not telling you. And that's that several of the lowest performing schools have small student bodies. And the most dangerous towns tend to be those with a smaller population. And the states that have the highest percentage of people with brain cancer tend to have smaller populations. So what's really going on here? Well, this has to do with the law of large numbers, which says in terms of percentages, more extreme things happen when we look at smaller populations. For example, if I flipped a coin four times, it would not be surprising if 75% of them landed heads or even 100%. These are extreme compared to the 50% expected outcome, but it would not take long for anyone flipping a coin to encounter this. However, if you flipped a coin a thousand times, it would take a lot of trials before you got 75% heads. See, when you flip a coin a few times, the percent that comes up heads can be kind of chaotic, bouncing around 50%. I mean, after one flip, you can have only 100 or 0% that came up heads. It's far from the mean, but after more trials, the outcome tends towards the expected value, or 50-50. So when we analyze small schools, it's like looking at this side of the graph, assuming these students are selected randomly. You're just gonna get those schools that are way above the mean and some that are way below the mean. As the population of the school grows and you grab more and more students from the population though, the overall scores will approach whatever the mean is. Now, I know many of you are probably saying, wait, it's not that simple because there are other factors to consider. And you're definitely right. Like with especially the private smaller schools, they may require you to do well in a certain test in order to get in. And if that's the case, that group of students will probably be just smarter on average. Or when looking at crime rates, we can't just ignore the poverty rates of that area and simply look at population size, since again, there are other factors to consider. But it is true that when you're looking at those smaller populations, you're just likely going to get more of those extreme outcomes. And when the Gates Foundation and all those other nonprofits put this to work, it turned out to be a failure. It wasn't because small schools are inherently worse or no different than larger ones, but rather education is more nuanced than simply looking at school size, and on a large scale it was just better for those funds to go elsewhere. But misinterpreting why several of the smaller schools were in fact outperforming the larger ones had already cost these organizations about a billion dollars. So now after that failure, for example, the Gates Foundation is more focused on putting money towards math and science programs, improving instruction, and more like that. Now for this next story, instead of ending with a lesson, I'm gonna start with it. And the lesson is, do not talk about percentages of numbers when the values that you're talking about can be negative. I got that lesson from this book here, which I highly recommend if you have not read it, but the author gives some great examples as to why this lesson is so important. Imagine you're running a clothing store where you maybe sell t-shirts, sweatshirts, hats, shoes, and pants. Now, let's say your net profit for a given month is $10,000, and 90% of that came from t-shirts. So my question to you is, how do you interpret this? It seems like t-shirts are really what's working for us, so maybe we should focus just on that, honestly. But what if I then told you that sweatshirts made up 70% of our profits? Well, now you're probably thinking, hey, there's that American education system at work brought to you by those who still use the Fahrenheit scale, but I promise these numbers are technically accurate. In fact, I'll keep going. I'll add that hats account for 30% of profits, shoes for 40%, and pants 50%. So how is this possible? Well, it's simply due to the fact that a business will include losses which we haven't considered yet. Let's say rent, advertising, cost of shipping the product, and all those expenses added up to $18,000 for the month. Well, now all the numbers make perfect sense. The t-shirts were 90% of the 10,000, which means we made $9,000 from those. The sweatshirts made up 70% of 10,000 or $7,000, and we just continue. That means our net sales were $28,000, then minus our expenses leaves us with 10,000. The numbers match up and the percentages are technically correct when it's with respect to that net result. If you want to talk about these percentages with respect to just your sales, where there are no negatives, then these would be the values, which makes way more sense. Now, I know plenty of you are saying, well, I wouldn't misinterpret the numbers like this, 
but hopefully you can see when it comes to the general population, it probably wouldn't be that hard to misinform people or just give them the numbers and have them misinterpret it for themselves. In fact, here are two examples where this misinterpretation has come up in politics. In June 2011, an article was released in Wisconsin celebrating the great work of their governor at the time. Turns out during a recent month, there was a net increase of 18,000 jobs throughout the entire nation, and 9,500 of those came from Wisconsin. So politicians from the state praised this, saying, hey, over 50% of nationwide job growth happened just in Wisconsin alone. Again, this is technically right, but not in the way we'd think. Because guess what? Massachusetts created 10,400 jobs in the month, accounting for about 58% of total job growth. In fact, just to emphasize how pointless these numbers can be, California added 28,800 jobs that month, meaning 160% of that net job growth happened in California. See, this clearly becomes nonsense because we can make the numbers say anything, and that's because 18,000 was the net increase. Missouri, in fact, was one state that lost 12,900 jobs. Virginia lost 14,600, and several more were in the red. After accounting for all 50 states, yes, the net growth was 18,000, but as we've seen, it's bad to refer to that value when talking about percentages. And politicians ran with this number. In fact, a representative went in front of an audience celebrating the job growth, saying, well, something we are doing here must be working. But it doesn't stop there because another very misleading number showed up in the presidential election between Mitt Romney and Barack Obama. In April 2012, Mitt Romney tweeted that 92.3% of people who lost their job under Obama's presidency were women. He also emphasized it in a speech around the same time. These are just some statistics which show just how severe the war on women has been by virtue of the president's failed policies. The number of jobs, this is an amazing statistic, the percentage of jobs lost by women in the president's three years, three and a half years, 92.3% of all the jobs lost during the Obama years have been lost by women. Now, I know at this point I sound pretty repetitive, but although this number is technically true, it's just not saying what we think it is. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, in January 2009 when Obama took office, total employment was just over 133 million. By March 2012, right before Mitt Romney published his tweet, total employment was about 132.8 million, a net loss of 740,000 jobs. The employment stats for women, on the other hand, went from about 66.1 million to 65.4 million, a loss of 683,000 jobs. We do the division and we get that exact figure of 92.3%, but that tells us nothing about what happened during that time. When we look at the numbers, we find that from the beginning of our interval, or January 2009, until February 2010, men lost way more jobs than women. While from February 2010 until the end of our time window, men gained just about the same amount back, whereas women didn't gain quite as much. So simply saying that 92.3% figure is pretty misleading. In fact, there was a portion of time where men had a net gain in jobs, but this was after suffering millions of job losses, while women had a net loss in that same window because they didn't suffer as much beforehand. With these figures, you could argue that women account for 3,000% of job losses, which makes no sense even though the math kind of works out. So you see, just pick the window of time you want, and you can pretty much make the data say whatever you want. Okay, now we're going to switch gears to a scenario regarding baseball players. Let's say there are two players that don't necessarily play for the same team, but they have had the exact same number of at-bats for a given season against pitchers of the same skill level. Now I'm going to use not very realistic baseball numbers here by the way, but it'll get the point across. So for the first half of the season, let's say player 1 had a batting average of 85%, while player 2 had a batting average of 90%. In the second half of the season, player 1 batted 50%, while player 2 batted 60%. And again, they had the exact same total number of at-bats. Now I think most people looking at these numbers would of course say player 2 is the better player, which is why it might be surprising if I said player 1 is in fact better and had more hits overall than player 2. But it's absolutely possible. The trick here is that I did not say they had the same number of at-bats for both the first and second half of the season, just the same amount overall. So let's say for the first half, player 1 had 20 at-bats, 17 of which were hits, leaving the 85% I said earlier. Then during the second half, they had 10 at-bats, 5 of which were hits, which of course yields 50%. That means out of 30 total at-bats, they had 22 hits. 
Now for player two, let's say for the first half of the season, they had 10 at-bats, nine of which were hits, giving us 90%. And for the second half, they had 20 at-bats, 12 of which were hits, giving us 60%. This player two has also had a total of 30 at bats, but only 21 of them were hits, which means their overall percentage was slightly lower than player one's. This is Simpson's paradox, something I mentioned in a previous video, but in regards to the acceptance rates of men and women at UC Berkeley. But as you can see, this paradox does show up in other places. And it comes up when trends seen in different groups of data tend to change or disappear when you analyze everyone or everything as a whole. In fact, a few decades ago, David Justice of the Atlanta Braves had a higher batting average than Derek Jeter in both 1995 and 1996. However, overall, when you look at both years combined, Derek Jeter still had a higher batting average. But the consequence of this can get much more serious when looking at medical treatments. Another famous case of this is with regards to kidney stone treatments, actually, where two certain types of treatments were tested against one another for large kidney stones and small kidney stones. Overall, treatment B was better, yet when looking at large and small kidney stones individually, treatment A came out ahead both times. See here the thing is, it's the overall numbers that are misleading, because this table says that treatment A is more effective for small stones and also for large ones. It's the treatment you're definitely going to prefer. But the misinterpretation comes from the fact that since treatment A is better, they use it for more of those large stone cases that are more serious. Yet for more serious cases, any treatment will just be less successful than when used on something more minor, as you can see by the smaller percentages on bottom compared to those on top. So you're using a better treatment more often on kidney stones that are harder to treat, and thus you get this seemingly paradoxical result. See, Simpson's paradox isn't really a paradox. It just shows how easy it can be to misinterpret data when it's presented like you've seen here. So when we look at data the wrong way, we can be not only sort of wrong, but we can come to conclusions that are exactly the opposite of the ones the numbers are really telling. In fact, just as another quick example, during the First World War, they found that incorporating metal helmets on soldiers increased the number of people who were hospitalized with head injuries. Looking at this, someone could definitely make the very weird assumption that helmets cause more head injuries. But remember, never be too quick to assume that correlation equates to causation. Because before helmets were incorporated, most people who suffered head injuries, like from a gunshot, died from it, obviously. So they were completely removed from the equation. Whereas with helmets, people had a higher chance to survive an injury to the head, and thus you have more head injuries in the hospital. I'm pretty sure they didn't remove the helmets due to this finding, but this example does highlight how completely counterintuitive the results can seem when you don't think enough about how the data was obtained. This was an example of survivorship bias, a logical error that occurs when you overlook a certain group of people, like those who die from head injuries. There are several more examples of this that I'm saving for an upcoming video actually, but the idea just fits so well here I wanted to include one example. Now, being able to analyze data and then extract useful information and meaning from it is an extremely valuable skill to have. In fact, there are people who have entire careers based on using powerful computer systems and efficient algorithms to solve problems by analyzing large amounts of data. And this is known as data science. Although this video wasn't about data science, hopefully it highlighted the importance of looking at data and numbers in the right way. But if you'd like to learn more about all the technical information regarding data science, one of the most high paying jobs there is right now, you can do so at Coursera, the sponsor of today's video. The classes they're sponsoring today are some of their most popular, and this isn't just one course, but rather an entire specialization consisting of several courses meant to take you from beginner to someone with a solid foundation in data science topics. The set of courses starts with teaching you how to program in R, one of the most popular languages for statistical computing and graphics. This is then followed with lectures about gathering data properly and how to handle large data sets that can come from a wide variety of sources. After a few weeks, they cover more of the mathematical side of things, including probability, Bayes' theorem, p-values, permutation tests, and more, to give you that required statistical background. And then you'll get to put that knowledge to work with practical machine learning, which includes forecasting, model-based prediction, and much more. All these courses come with built-in lectures, quizzes, example problems, and various projects to give you the hands-on experience just like you're in a normal class setting. And several people who complete these courses report starting a new career or just getting a tangible career benefit as a direct result. So if you're interested and want to support the channel, you can click the links below and get started immediately. Otherwise, I'm going to end that video there. If you guys enjoyed, be sure to like and subscribe. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter and join the Major Prep Facebook group for updates on everything. And I'll see you all in the next video.